Hi, this is Doug Wisner from Will's Eye. Uh, this is a recording of uh, cataract surgery, quick chop technique using bimanual irrigation aspiration. And uh, we'll, we'll have here in a moment is paired up with my hand positioning associated with the surgical video. So I made my paracentesis. It should be noted that I'm left-handed. Uh, and so I'm making my second paracentesis, uh, which is going to be approximately 80 degrees away, 80, 90 degrees away from my main incision. I like to hold the paracentesis uh, if possible when making an incision because I feel it gives greater control of the globe. I put one tip in and one tip out. Typically the side with one tooth goes in the eye. So here I'm injecting intracameral anesthetic um, with um, a dilating agent, also known as sugarcane. You can see this patient's well dilated, but uh, not massively. Um, I am take a little bit of time to inject the sugar cane. I think it only takes a few extra seconds. I'd rather have maximal dilation and iris tone. Here I'm using a dispersive viscoelastic to fill the chamber. You can see I go in, inject a little, start distally, and then let the wave of viscoelastic push fluid or any air bubbles out. Once you see a little burp of viscoelastic out of the paracentesis, you know you've got enough in the eye. Putting more viscoelastic in is only going to push more out of the eye. So here I am fixating with the paracentesis. I use a 2.4 millimeter keratome, creating a short um, partial thickness incision uh, to create an entry point for my keratome. This gives a smooth uh, flap in the cornea. And then I'm uh, progressing, angling up into the cornea and then down uh, towards the uh, center of the lens. So, in essence, with one instrument, created a true triplanar wound that seals quite nicely. So, now I'm going to go ahead and open the capsule. I used a cystotome to initiate my capsulotomy. I'm left handed, but I do a rexus like a right handed person would. So, I move out and then pull down. Being very gentle at this point, lifting the needle tip off just enough to grab the capsule, not cortex, and flip over um, the edge of that capsule. Here I'm using a pair of utrata forceps to grab that flap. I'm going to pull down, rotate in the wound, and twist in the wound to take maximum advantage, and then draw the flap centrally to reset it before I re-grab, because I want to put the edge of the flap up towards me. I'm aiming for about a five and a half to five and three quarters millimeter rexus. And in experienced hands, usually three to four grabs is all that's necessary to complete the rexus. This should not be your primary priority when learning. Next step is hydrodissection. I use a flat hydrodissection cannula because I feel like it's a good seal. There's a fluid wave you just saw progress. I tap down on the lens, go to the other side, see some lens rise, push down again, then go peripheral and pull back towards the wound nice and slow. See the lens start to rotate. You've got to be peripheral in the endonuclear epinuclear junction because you're trying to develop torque. If you try to spin and you're not peripheral, you're just going to end up pushing posterior on the lens. Here I'm using a balanced FACO tip, and I'm showing enough metal um, up to the bend in the balanced tip in order to get adequate hold on the material for a chopping technique. Um, this is a Nikkeman, um chopper used for a vertical quick chop. Here I'm clearing off the cortex. Sometimes using a fine, a little bit of FACO power to do so. Once I'm clear, then I'll have a very steep angle of attack and angle my FACO tip down all the way in, FACOing in until the silicone sleeve is occluded. Then I drop my second instrument in, out near the rexus, and slide back towards my um, FACO tip and spread, and sometimes I'll do a cross action. Then I'll drop my second instrument in again where I want to make my next crack, go in with the FACO, and spread. There is a little bit of a horizontal motion here. I felt feel this helps to create a good cleavage plane, especially in dense or soft lenses. 
And again, each time you see me dropping my second instrument where I want to make the crack. So I'm having economy of movement. And so I'm not moving fast in the eye, but all my movements are purposeful. Typically, you want to subdivide into uh, six uh, segments. This is different from a divide and conquer technique where you're removing nuclear material while you're creating your grooves. In this case, you need to make the pieces smaller in order to get them out of that rexus. So I usually go for my smallest piece, try to grab it near an edge. It's like lifting a piece of pizza, a deep dish pizza out, and then I'll go grab an adjacent piece. I'm using my second instrument primarily to push the uh, nuclear fragment off of my FACO tip so that I don't end up with a nuclear fragment that's a piece of Swiss cheese. I want to generally have my FACO tip be on the edge of the nuclear material, kind of having that nuclear material cartwheel into the FACO tip. Um, so once I get one of the hemis removed, then I'll spin around. I think it's important to do all of your cracking in the bag. If you try to crack outside of the bag, then um, the nuclear material is more likely to rotate because you have more degrees of freedom or more potential axes of rotation. So again, you can see I'm just using my second instrument to primarily push things off. This, I'm using an active fluidics machine, so the chamber is nice and stable as long as I'm not pushing down on my wounds. Um, so I'm not using my second instrument to push the bag, bag back because the, I should, if I'm a good surgeon, be allowing the, the fluid to do that. So we got all the cortex out. Everything looks okay. Using bimanual IA here, which is my preferred technique because um, you have two incisions, you can switch back and forth. You never need to struggle with sub-incisional cortex. A little bit of trouble getting in here. Sometimes it's easier to go in on irrigation. Um, the eye has a little bit more resistance. Not sure what I was doing there. All right, here we go. So I typically like to start opposite and I try to get 180 degrees of, of cortical material. And um, what I'm doing is trying to sweep in a tangential motion. And then when I stop getting more material, then I'll draw centrally. In general, <coughs> moving in a tangential motion while doing IA, this distributes the force along more zonules than pulling centrally, so you're less likely to create a zonulopathy, or if there's a pre-existing zonulopathy, less likely to weaken it. So now you'll see that I'm switching sides, and uh, the uh, subincisional cortex under the main wound has already been addressed. I think the um, particular set of IA I'm using here is just a little bit large, uh, for my um, paracentesis, I typically like to use a side pore blade for my paracentesis. Um, so I think I made them a little bit too small in this case here. Here I am forming up the globe a little bit more to get some more resistance. And then I'm going to take the side pore blade, kind of shimmy back in and enlarge the wound a little bit. Again, sorry, that's a 22.5 um, paracentesis blade. I prefer to use a side port blade because um, it's a standard um, width related to the stab of a blade, and I feel that gives you better wound architecture that wasn't available in this particular case here. So now you can see I get in nicely. Rather than forcing my way in, remove the rest of the cortical material. I'm quite happy with this. You can polish with bimanual IA. If you're using a reusable bimanual IA, just make sure that it's well taken care of by your sterile processing. Any metallic burrs on the uh, aspiration tip can tear the, the bag. Always come out with aspiration first. You can also polish the underside of the bag. Just futzing around with a little bit more cortex here. Good. You can see my hand positioning. I'm always trying to 
rest one hand on the patient and when I'm only using one instrument in the eye like filling with fish elastic I use both hands to control it typically one would uh, uh, twist and one would inject. So here's the IOL going in, putting a little bit of nasal pressure. And then you can use a Lester or a Sinsky to manipulate the IOL into position. I like to use bimanual IA. You can use coaxial IA for this as well. But I figure I'm going in anyway. I can use the IA to manipulate the haptics into proper position. Um, save myself a step. This is particularly useful in the setting of um, uh, advanced technology intraocular lenses like toric IOLs or situations where the um, zonular support is slightly precarious. You can see the IOL jump there. That's what I'm looking for. That means I got the viscoelastic from behind the IOL because I put in a cohesive viscoelastic for IOL insertion. So I don't routinely go behind the IOL uh, as long as I see um, the IOL um, flutter a little bit. Here I'm hydrating my paracentesis. When I'm doing bimanual IA, I do hydrate the paracentesis on both sides um, because you're working in it more and you can stretch the, the wound a little bit more. But the benefit is that um, the main wound um, doesn't require as much hydration um, because you're doing less manipulation to the main wound. So here I am just doing final lens positioning, make sure I'm happy. I'm irrigating at the very end as I come out, checking the pressure. I'd rather have an eye that's a little bit firm than too soft. I don't want it to be sucking air. I make sure everything is watertight. I'm happy with that. Eye looks a little bit firm there. So I'm not sure what I'm waiting for here. Should have in just a minute. All right, yes, so um, just adjusting the pressure a little bit, a little bit more hydration. There we go. Good. All right, now I'm happy with that. And you'll notice when I'm checking for leaks, I'm just dabbing at the wound. I'm not scraping along it. You can create an abrasion by dragging the wax cell along the cornea. All right, we're all done. Uh, thanks very much for watching.